Welcome to the Kicks EAP podcast, your monthly podcast with important leaders in education from Eastern Europe, Middle East and North Africa, Central Asia, and the Asia Pacific. I'm your host, Ryan Allen, assistant professor at Chapman University here in Southern California, and my own background is in international and comparative education. Let's start the show. Today, I welcome Dr. Lunmila Malkochi, Executive Director of Keystone Moldova. As usual, we cover her background and experience in the region, but I'm quite excited to share her work with Ukrainian refugees who have disabilities fleeing the war with Russia. It's really inspiring work. Let's jump to the interview. Thank you for joining me today, Lunmila. It's, uh, it's an honor to meet you and going through your experience and your work. I- I'm really excited for this podcast episode. You know, one one thing that I noticed in in your CV is that uh, you actually you have a degree in in journalism before you sort of moved off into social science and, and education. So, can you maybe talk about your your trajectory into your educational background? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Anyway, you know, all my educational background are very linked one to others. Frank, frankly speaking, you know, I had I have a background in journalism, but. Um, after that, I uh, had my two PhD, like uh, the first one, degree of PhD and PhD habilitation, also in sociology of mass media, you know, it, it was like related to mass media and public opinion here in Moldova. And practically, that is why everything is linked. And frankly speaking, I'd like to say that I'm still teaching uh, at the journalistic department, the methodology, <laughs> the methodology of the research in the communication. And uh, practically, you know, I'm still linked to to this uh, journalistic department. And also, I'd like to say that that's uh, that's a big benefit for uh, for me because uh, practically, I am getting in touch with the future journalist. I try to integrate disability, you know, in uh, uh, journalism uh, education, you know, field. And uh, practically everything, I think it is going hand by hand. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I actually, my undergraduate degree is in, in public relations. And then I moved sort of in uh, social science and then education for my PhD. So we, we actually have similar types of backgrounds. And I do often find myself drawing on those experiences of, you know, g- giving presentations or, or talking to other other journalists and things like that. So yeah, no, that I think it's uh, an underrated skill for for um, educators. If we could then maybe talk a little bit about your experience as uh, Keystone Moldova Executive Director and and what is, what is that organization? What what is the what is the focus? Okay, I started to work with Keystone Moldova and Keystone in general in two thousand eight. You know, it is like. Uh, already 14 years, you know, working with uh, Keystone. And uh, practically uh, the Keystone uh, activities are related uh, to social inclusion of persons with intellectual disabilities, but also we are supporting other vulnerable groups, for example, developing uh, social care services for uh, children from vulnerable families, for children from poorer families and so on and so on. Uh, Keystone had a mission, has a mission here in Moldova. We are practically, um, our mission is, um, is, uh, is very close to, as I told you, to um, inclusion. And practically, I would like to say that during these 14 years of our activities, uh, you know, we, um, we were a very good partner for the um, uh, national, um, uh, national public authorities and local public authorities for, um, uh, reforms in the social protection field and practically we supported the Ministry of Labor, Social Protection and Family to start the deinstitutionalization process here in Moldova. With Keystone uh, Moldova support more than 600 of persons with intellectual disabilities and uh, with mental health, you know, including children, they have been transferred from big residential institutions to community-based services and uh, we supported those persons not only, you know, through this process of day institutionalization and reintegration in their families or in other services, but we supported them, you know, you know along their life with uh, support for educational inclusion, support for labor inclusion, you know, support even for uh, developing uh, and the, of their families, you know, for their family life, support, uh, I mean, day by day life and so on and so on. And also, I would like to say that um, in parallel with uh, 
that the institutionalization process in order to build this sustainable approach, you know, uh, to uh, in the social protection field, we supported the uh, government to um, uh, develop the policy, inclusive policy in the field. In 2010, uh, the Republic of Moldova ratified the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and it was a need, you know, for revision and adaptation and, let's say, development of new legislation in the field, of new policies in the field, in line with this uh, UN Convention. And practically, Kiss from Moldova supported the government to uh, develop the law on social inclusion, to develop two strategies on social inclusion, the strategy on the institutionalization of persons with uh, disabilities. Uh, we also supported the government to develop uh, standards and regulations for seven new types of community-based services, like supported living, mobile team services, personal assistance services, like uh, community homes, uh, uh, shared living services, um, and so on and so on. And uh, meantime, uh, we also piloted those types of services at the local level. And we encourage local public administration to develop those services uh, and also to budget the, these services. And practically with Keystone support in Moldova, there were developed like around 170, let's say, uh, community-based services for persons with disabilities and uh, including intellectual disabilities and mental health. All those services, uh, they have been budgeted by local public administration. We supported local public authorities to accredit those services. And um, this is like that. And in parallel, we also, we also supported, the, supported the process of um, promotion uh, for inclusive education in the country. Because uh, those time when we started to deinstitutionalize kids with disabilities, you know, in the country nobody was talking about, you know, possibility of inclusion of those kids in, in, uh, in mainstream schools, you know. And we started to work with the Ministry of Education. It was, I think, 2009, 2010, and also with local public authorities. And uh, we integrated um, the first 35 kids. They institutionalized from these residential institutions in um, 15 schools and 15 kindergartens. And practically, we follow those kids because, uh, uh, you know, uh, they have been deinstitutionalized in their communities, you know, and in their families. And uh, we didn't have a choice, like, to select the best school or, or the most open school for that, you know. <laughs> we worked with the school from the village from where this uh, child was, you know, and it was very, very difficult, but uh, right. in time, uh, we supported the schools to establish educational support services, <laughs> like support teachers, like um, resource centers for inclusive education, and so on and so on. Wow, thank you. That's, yeah, that's, well, that sounds wonderful, you know, moving from 2010, where there's maybe no supports into a system where you know there's there's people caring and, and there's an organization surrounding these students. So I'm actually curious, how did how did you get inspired maybe to to start working with with uh, students with disabilities or to take on this this role where maybe it didn't exist in the country before? Frankly speaking, Ryan, you know uh, when we start you start this process of working with families, local public authorities on this day institutionalization process. As I told you, that means much, much more than practically transferring kids, you know, from residential institutions to their families. And we assume this is possibility that we need to support the family, you know. And practically, initially, we supported the family, you know, to adapt their places, you know, for those kids. Many families were very vulnerable, you know. They needed some support, for example, to build a bathroom. We supported some families to buy some, uh, you know, uh, like uh, cows, some animals, you know, uh, around the ho their, their households in order that they will have nutrition for their food for their kids and so on. We, um, we worked around based on uh, needs assessment. It was an individual uh, uh, 
uh, needs assessment of every child or of every person with disabilities, we developed at the local level support groups. And uh, in those support groups, we have had family members of this child or of this adult person. We have had also the majority, uh, the representative of school or kindergarten, if this uh, kid if this was a kid and he needs to go to school, you know, and practi practically we had this um, uh, personal um, assistance planning session uh, uh, with all, all of those persons. And based on this, uh, these planning sessions, we all together were assessing the needs of this kid, the needs of uh, their families, and we developed this individual assessment, uh, individual plans for that. and. Educational inclusion, uh, sometimes it was part of this plan. And from these perspectives, we started already to work with schools uh, for better educational inclusion of this uh, child in the school. Working with schools, me that means not only developing these uh, uh, support services for inclusive education, but that also means working with typical children and with their families in order to combat discrimination or to prevent discrimination of those kids in schools. Uh, that means uh, supporting families, uh, even maybe pa uh, parents, you know, to get a job. Uh, that means also working with neighbors around, you know, in order that they will, uh, will be part of this supportive network. And it was, it was and it, it is still, I think, very, very nice, you know, because um, in fact, this approach was like the, uh, was focused on building this networking, on mo mobilizing communities for support, and uh, in some in, in many communities it uh, it increased the social cohesion of those communities. Wow, that sounds wonderful! You you really are connecting all different aspects of the community to to help support these these children. I think that's just that's such a wonderful experience. If we could, you know, one of the things that you're that that you've recently been involved in is Ukrainian refugees coming in, and especially those with uh, disabilities, and especially face um, tough hardships. Can you maybe talk about that um, experience and kind of what Keystone's doing and 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 how it's sort of operating uh, under these conditions? Yes, of course. We started to work on those issues, you know, from the first day of this war. Practically, and for us, it was very important to uh, that disability will be integrated, you know, in all this emergency plan. From these perspectives, uh, we um, uh, tried to be connected with UNHCR, and practically, um, when they first started working in Moldova, they didn't have a, like a plan developing a separate disability task force. But uh, we advocated for this separate disability task force because we understood that it is very important, you know, uh, to support persons with disabilities, refugees, and uh, to integrate, you know, uh, all their needs in, in these emergency plans. And practically, Keystone now is leading this uh, disability task force group. Uh, in this disability task force group, uh, we are meeting every, every week. Even today, we had a meeting. We have uh, representatives of national NGOs, international NGOs, we have representatives of the government. Uh, we have representatives of UNHCR. And this is a very good, uh, let's say, um, mode of coordination of all our you know, activities. And practically, of, uh, uh, fun it's a very good mode of uh, identification of the most important and urgent needs. And also of identification of donors that can support those needs. I would like to say that uh, we are working very closely with all, all NGOs. We developed an advocacy action plan based on the most emergency needs of persons with disabilities, refugees. And we try to find, uh, let's say, partners for implementation of this advocacy plan. For example, one of the issues that we identified was... Uh, a low level of accessibility of shelters for persons with disabilities. We had a meeting with the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection uh, State Secretary. We talked about that. We requested that they will, um, let's say, uh, have like at least two shelters uh, that uh, with increased accessibility. 
Finally, we got a disposition from the ministry about places for persons with disabilities in two shelters with increased accessibility. And now we have one NGO working on improving this accessibility of the shelters. And I think that that's, uh, that's a very good mode of uh, joint work uh, together. Meantime, Keystone developed two support services for persons with disabilities refugees. Uh, we are delivering a hotline service for persons with disability in general in Moldova. This hotline service is uh, paid by the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection. And uh, starting with February 25, we extended the hotline service for persons with disabilities refugees. We, um, um, and we also hired one additional counselor. The hotline service is delivering services 24 hours seven days a week and practically uh, we um, they are delivering information services reference services to other organizations they have a developed database on all other services existing in the country for persons with disabilities refugees they are delivering also um, uh, psychological counseling and direct support services and our hotline service is a little bit different from others because we are not only supporting persons with information. We are trying to connect persons with other services and we are mentoring them and monitoring if they solve the problems. We are like doing some kinds of some kind of case management for all those, you know, persons with disabilities that apply to the hotline. We established also a mobile team for persons with disabilities refugees. Our mobile team includes a doctor and the social workers. And practically, they, has, they are assessing the needs of persons with disabilities that are placed in uh, families and that are placed in uh, shelters. And uh, after that, we are supporting those persons based on their needs. Keystone is also like representative of European Association of Service Providers for supporting uh, persons with disability refugees. And practically, the ESPD is supporting the transition uh, of persons with disabilities, you know, the evacuation from Ukraine and transition to, to other countries. And also we, we are working very closely with um, Israel Yed. Uh, we have a playground uh, near the custom Palanka and uh, every week this playground is for mothers and babies. They are um, delivering services like for around 300 mothers and 400 uh, children or babies. Those persons, they are waiting for buses, you know, that are uh, going, uh, evacuating them to Germany, you know, from the custom or to Romania and so on. Sometimes they need to wait, you know, like uh, uh, 24 hours. And meantime, you know, they have a place, like a playground for their children. Also, they can receive some support information there. Uh, they can receive, you know, some clothes if they need and so on. Wow, that's incredibly important work. And, and I'm, actually, I'm honored that you would take a break from that work and, and come <laughs> on this podcast with me. So I, I do thank you for that. Uh, I, I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into that and, and maybe connect with education. And from my understanding, Moldova, uh, especially linguistically, some people learn like Romanian and then others are sort of maybe there's uh, Russian language schools. Can you maybe talk about that, di that divide and how, uh, how the country sort of balances um, that education? Uh, yes, uh, we have a multilingual, let's say, environment here in Moldova. I'd like to say that in general, um, uh, we have about like one set of the population, like Russia speaking languages, you know, and practically <laughs> we have Transnistria region where the majority are like, like Russia speak speakers and we have Gagauzia region where also the majority are like Russia speakers. Uh, meantime, we have developed, uh, we have Romanian schools, we have Ukrainian schools and Russia schools. From my information, you know, from one week ago, we have like around maybe 1,600 children, refugees integrated in, uh, in our schools. And that is very nice because, you know, uh, they, they have these uh, opportunities to be integrated. Some of them are integrated in Romanian schools because they came from those regions from Odessa that, uh, uh, you know, before the Second War, they were part of Romania, you know. 
Some of them are integrated in Ukrainian schools uh, and uh, many of them are integrated also in Russia schools because Odessa, they, they had also like a big population uh, speaking Russia language. Right. Wow. I mean, I, I'm curious, you know, w- w- what's the sense on the ground there? Is it, is it uh, uh, hopeful or excited or, or apprehensive? I know it's, it's potentially a difficult time. So are, are you doing okay? Is the organization doing okay? Um, just to, just to. Check. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> it is very difficult to say because it is a very difficult time. We are dealing with emergencies. And practically, for example, Keystone is implementing now 14 projects, you know, various types. For example, um, we have um, a big project that is focused on development of social canteen services. Uh, We have a big project uh, that is focused, let's say, on development of social services, uh, you know, in um, uh, in, in, um, in rural areas that are related to vulnerable children or persons with disabilities. And meantime, we are also uh, focused on increasing the capacities of grassroots NGOs, you know, to implement, you know, those services and to deliver the services and so on. Uh, it's, it's much, much more work than before. Practically, because of this emergency, some we, we need to, to do in the same time, you know, to work on our previous projects and meantime to... Uh, to assume these uh, responsibilities for emergency actions. For example, all those activities that I am dealing with as a, uh, as a leader for this task force, it takes me a lot of time. Uh, meantime, you know, this is like that. You don't have time to think. You need just to act. <laughs> oh, wow. And this is an issue, you know, sure. practically. Sure. Wow. Well, again, thank you for for taking time to to do this. It's much appreciated. I have a question a little bit about, you know, you've worked with World Bank, you've worked with a lot of international organizations, but you also work quite closely with the government, various ministries in in Moldova and in the region. Can you kind of talk about how you sort of act as a uh, mediator or an in-between with with the governments and and with these international organizations? And, And is there... Is there barriers or difficulties to sort of get them to align? Yeah, uh, definitely. I had a huge, let's say, international expertise, you know, because I see I worked uh, in Turkey for European Union. I worked on participatory budgeting and participatory strategic planning, you know, in Russia with the World Bank. Uh, You know, um, I worked also in Ukraine with Social Investment Fund. It was back in 2000, 2001, like that, you know. I worked on uh, integration of gender dimensions, you know, in infrastructure projects, including in Romania, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge expertise. But uh, I think that based on this uh, huge expertise and my previous expertise of working with various governments, you know, I think for me it is easier now to work with my own government <laughs> because, <laughs> because um, uh, you know, um, uh, f- f- first of all, I would like to say that we never do something in some something in the country without the involvement of the government, uh, without the involvement of the authorities. And uh, my approach is based on that. First of all, this is their responsibilities, you know, and they need to be capable to deal with those uh, with all those activities, including with emergency, for example, and so on. From this perspective, see if you expect something from them, you need to involve them in that. And involvement means also, you know, um, capacitation, strengthening their capacities, because that is uh, very important, not just through the training, but also through involvement. And uh, practically, uh, if you are involving them, they are, your par- they are your, let's say, partners, you know, and colleagues for that. I would like just to say that Talking also about education, Keystone now, for example, uh, we are uh, providing uh, technical assistance to two governmental commissions on education and on social protection, and also to two uh, parliamentarian commissions on education and on social protection, and also to uh, the Ministry of Education, because now the Ministry of Education and the Parliamentary Commission, they would like to revise a little bit the concept of 
inclusive education in the country, you know, to focus more on development of new types of uh, inclusive education support services in the country, you know, and um, uh, practically they needed this assistance and they addressed like Soros Foundation, you know, for support. And now we are implementing uh, the project that is focused on uh, this technical assistance. We have a, a group of consultants that are mapping um, the existing uh, educational support services for children with four types of disabilities, like with intellectual disabilities, autism, with uh, sensorial disabilities, you know. And we, we also um, are mapping, you know, like their needs, the services, and try to evaluate if, uh, if the services correspond to their needs. Based on that, uh, we would be developed like packages of support services based on needs of various of children with various types of disabilities and will be developed also let's say the costing for those types of services and finally we hope that by september october we'll have all those costs and maybe for the next year we will have already integrated in the budgets new types of educational services to support the inclusion of all children with various types of disabilities in mainstream schools. Wow, what what an important step! Thank you, thank you for uh, covering that. You know, we're kind of coming to the interview. I know you have a lot of crucial work coming up. So no problem, no problem, Ryan. It's it's a it's a pleasure just to look back and to try to an analyze gently with you some of the aspects. You know? <laughs> sure, thank you, and I, I'm I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, it, it, maybe I I would just like to give you a final word on. What's what's something that you would like the international community and and people around the world in our audience just uh, to take away from uh, Moldova or your experience uh, with Keystone? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that evidently in each country there are various types of very precious, let's say, expertise, you know, and it is very important to share this expertise because sharing the expertise um, and sh sharing even the lessons learned it is very important for all of us. Because in this case, you can avoid, you know, some steps uh, when you are supporting like the government, you know, in this reforming process, transition process and so on. And I would, I would like just to address international community this advice that uh, to, to have more possibilities and opportunities, you know, for sharing the expertise through podcasts, you know, through other communication means and so on, because, uh, because that is very important. Even yesterday, we had this ESPD webinar on how to host uh, uh, persons with uh, disabilities, refugees, and we had in the webinar like four country representatives. And that is very important, you know, because each of us has some, some piece of expertise, you know, and we could consolidate this expertise and lessons learned, and we could do better for social inclusion and for educational inclusion, evidently, of persons with uh, disabilities and we can build this like more inclusive world i think wow yeah well, per perfect message for for this podcast because that's exactly what we're hoping to do uh Ludmil, thank you for uh joining me today it's it's been a wonderful uh, discussion and this concludes our kicks eap podcast which is released every first wednesday of the month of course the opinions expressed on the kicks eap podcast are solely those of the host and the guest the Kix EAP podcast is made possible by Kix, which stands for Knowledge and Innovation Exchange. Kix is an initiative of the Global Partnership for Education. Globally, Kix is administered by the International Development Research Center in Canada. NORAG in Geneva hosts one of the four regional hubs of Kix. Find us on the NORAG or GPE Kix websites. You can subscribe to the Kix EAP podcast, newsletter, and webinar series and also learn about Kik's global or regional projects. Additionally, you can subscribe directly on Spotify or SoundCloud to receive notifications of the new monthly podcast episodes. Thanks for listening.